Okay guys, good morning. So our story this week is going to be At the Beach, Abuelito's Story. And if you notice the genre, it's realistic fiction. So while the story's made up, the events in it could actually happen in real life. To begin with, just like always, find this in your book, page 182. Take a few minutes to preview the story, predict what it's going to be about, see if you can come to any predictions about where or when the story takes place based on the graphic sources in the passage. When you've done that, then hit play on this video again and continue with the notes. All right, continuing on. I remember those evenings well when I was a young boy in Cuba, those balmy island nights before a trip to Guanabo Beach, the spicy aroma of tortilla española that mommy had left to cool would waft through the house as I lay in my bed. But I, I was always too excited to sleep. All I could think about was the soft white sand, the warm, foamy water, and mommy's delicious tortilla. I, a day at the beach, it was full of possibilities. One Saturday in May, I was awakened at the crack of dawn by sounds of laughter. My aunts, Rosa and Olga, had arrived with hammocks, blankets, and an iron killet, kettle filled with Aunt Rosa's steaming concrete. And best of all, they had arrived with my cousins, Louisa, Mary, and little Javi. Uncle Tony had come, too. When we were ready to leave, Poppy, the only one in the family who owned a car, packed his Ford Woody wagon with the nine of us. No one cared that we children had to squeeze into the back along with the clutter of pots and plates, food and bags, towels and blankets and hammocks. Soon, the engine turned and the car rumbled down the road into the rising sun. Along the way, we drove past sugarcane fields and roadside markets. My cousins and I shouted warnings to the barking dogs and laughed at the frightened hens that scurried in every direction at the sight of our car. It seemed like a long time until the cool morning breeze that blew into the windows turned warm, and the growing heat made the aroma of mommy's tortillas all the more tempting. Lick your skin, Fernando, my older cousin Luisa told me. If it tastes salty, that means we'll be there any time now. She was right. My skin tasted salty. And soon, almost magically, the turquoise ocean appeared as we rounded a bend in the road. Pappy pulled into the familiar dirt lot and parked under the pine trees. While the grown-ups unloaded the car, we eagerly jumped out and ran toward the sea, peeling off our clothes along the way. Remember, don't go too far, Mommy and Aunt Olga warned us sternly from the distance. I turned to see them picking up our scattered clothing. When we reached the edge of the ocean, the water felt cold. I waded further in and went under to warm, and went under to warm up quickly. When I emerged, I saw Louisa, Mary, and little Javi all standing in the clear water. They were watching the schools of tiny gold and black striped fish rush between their legs. Then they swam over to join me, and together we rode the big waves. Later, Uncle Tony came in to play shark with us. We splashed and swallowed the stinging sea water as he chased us above and under the waves. But after a while, we tired him out, and he went back to sit with the grown-ups. I was getting very hungry, and for a moment I thought of returning with, with him to sneak a bite of Mommy's tortilla. But then I had a better idea. Let's explore the reef, I said. See, everyone agreed. Let's go. We all splashed out of the water and ran, dripping wet across the sand. High above, the sun beat down on us. When we got to the marbled rocks, Louisa looked concerned. Our moms told us not to come this far, she said. I know the way well, I replied. Besides, nobody will notice. They're too busy talking. I looked in the distance and saw Mommy and my two aunts in the, shade, in the shady spot they had picked. They had set up a nice camp. The hammocks were tied to the pine trees. The blankets were spread over the fine sand. Pappy and Uncle Tony played dominoes while they sipped coffee and shared the Carucho de Mani 
they had purchased from the peanut vendor. They were having fun. No one would miss us for a long time. Watch out for sea urchins, I warned as I led the group on our climb. The spiny black sea urchins hid inside the crevices and crannies of the rough boulders. It was very painful if you stepped on one. Louisa and Mary followed behind me. They were careful to only step on the rocks I stepped on. Little Javi came last. He stopped constantly to look at the chubitos, the tiny hermit crabs that scurried around on the rocks and at the iridescent tropical fish that were concealed in the deepest tide pools. I had to keep checking behind me to make sure he didn't stray from our path. Just then I turned around to watch helplessly as Javi slipped on an algae-covered rock. Ciudado, I warned, but it was too late. Ay, he shrieked, and then began to cry uncontrollably. Cautiously, we all hurried back to help Javi. Louisa and Marie crouched down to examine his foot. He stepped on a sea urchin, Mary cried. Now what are we going to do? We should have never followed you, Louisa lamented. We'll all be punished. At that moment, I did not want to think of what the punishment would be. What if we couldn't have any of Mammy's tortilla? All I knew was that we had to help Javi right away. I looked around and found a piece of driftwood. Louisa, I ordered, hold his leg still while I remove the urchin from his foot. Louisa held Javi's leg still, as Mary held his hand and tried to comfort him, but Javi's desperate cries were now drowning out the sound of the sea. I pulled and tugged, but the urchin wouldn't budge. It was stuck to Javi's foot by the tips of its spines. Javi was scared and in pain, and we were too far from our parents to ask for help. What if we couldn't get Javi back? I struggled relentlessly until I was able to until I was finally able to remove the spiny creature from his foot. Gently Louisa poured some sea water over Javi's foot. That was when she noticed there was still a piece of the sea urchin's spine lodged in it. Javi wasn't going to be able to walk back, and he was much too heavy for us to carry. We had to remove that piece of spine so that he could walk on his own. The sun burnt our backs as we all took turns trying to dislodge the sea urchin's spine. I have an idea, said Louisa suddenly. She removed her hair berets and held them like tweezers. Then, with the smallest movement, she pulled the broken spine out. With that solved, we started back. I helped Javi walk on his sore foot. He wept and limped with every step. Our, back, our walk back seemed endless. As we got closer, I realized that we would have to explain how it was that we went to the reef in the first place. I would surely end up with no tortilla if we told the truth. What will we do now? Marie asked. We'll have to tell our parents what happened, said Louisa, matter-of-factly. No, I said emphatically. We'll be punished for sure. We walked the rest of the way in silence. The sound of crashing waves, children playing, and seagulls' calls became a background drone to Javi's cries. When we finally reached our parents, Javi was crying louder than ever. Aunt Olga took one look at him and gasped, Ninos! Children! What's happened to Javi? Maria looked at Luisa. Luisa looked at me. Javi cried even louder. Well, I hesitated. By now, everyone was staring at me. We were walking along the beach looking for cockles and urchin shells, I began, when I found a live sea urchin attached to a piece of driftwood. So I called the others. Javi came running so fast that he stepped on it by accident. Louisa and Marie stared at me in disbelief. I didn't think they liked my story. Let me see your foot, Javi, Aunt Olga said, kneeling next to her son. Mammy and Aunt Rosa looked on as Aunt Olga examined Javi's foot closely. Then she gave him a big hug and a kiss. He's fine, she said at last. It looks like the children were able to pull it out. At this good news, Javi's tears disappeared and were replaced by a big broad smile. 
I'm hungry, he said. Then let's have lunch, Aunt Olga suggested. I was dumbfounded. Not only had they believed me, but we were also going to eat Mommy's tortillas. The men went back to their domino game. The women went back to their conversation as they busied themselves serving everybody. No one but me seemed to notice how quiet Louisa and Mary had grown. Mammy handed me a plate filled with my favorite foods. The tortilla smelled delicious, but I was unable to eat. I looked up at Louisa and Marie, who were quietly picking at their food. I watched Mammy as she served herself and sat next to my aunt's. I looked at my plate again. How could I enjoy my food when I knew I had done something I wasn't supposed to do? There was only one thing I could do now. I stood up, picked up my plate, and went right over to Mammy. What's wrong, Fernando? Mammy asked. I looked back at Louisa and Marie and swallowed hard. Then I handed my, Mammy my untouched plate. You wouldn't have given me this if I had told you the truth, I said. Mammy looked puzzled. The whole group grew silent and watched me struggle. I was very embarrassed. It was my fault, Louisa said. I should have stopped them. And I went along, said Marie. No, no, it was my idea to go to the reef, I said. Then I told everyone about our adventure at the reef. When I was finished, Mammy looked at me with, at me with tear-filled eyes. You're right, Fernando, she said. I should punish you for doing something you knew not to do. Somebody could have been seriously hurt. I know, I whispered, and I'm sorry. But then the glimmer of a smile softened Mammy's expression. She slid her arm over my shoulders as she said, You know, Fernando, anyone can make a mistake, but not everyone has the courage to admit it. Gracias. Thank you for telling the truth. That afternoon, under the shade of the pine trees, the nine of us sat down on the old blankets for lunch. We had congri bread and Mammy's famous tortilla espanola. And you know something? That day it tasted better than it ever had before.